1994, Formula 1 was rocked by a series of shocking events that changed the sport forever. It was a season that claimed the lives of two drivers, Ayrton Senna and Roland Ratzenberger, and injured many others, not only drivers, but spectators and marshals. It was a season that saw Michael Schumacher and Damon Hill clash on and off the track with scandals, penalties, race bans and controversies. It was also the season that almost killed the Formula 1 commentator Martin Brundle, not once, but twice. Stay tuned for a crazy story. I'll be honest, when I first started writing the script for this video, it was initially a 94 season review, focusing on the Schumacher vs Hill title battle. But the more I dove into the research, the more I realised how crazy this season actually was and how lucky Formula 1 was that only two people died. Which is odd to say, because it isn't the 60s or 70s, it was 1994. Formula 1 had improved a lot since those dark days when deaths were the norm. There wasn't a fatality since the tragic 1982 season, which Formula 1 learned from and safety had improved, but complacency had slowly seeped in. It all started before the season even got underway. The FIA introduced a raft of rule changes. They banned a lot of electronic driver aids like traction control, which made the cars harder to drive. Within the new rules, refueling was added for the first time in 10 years, bringing in a different style of racing, a more flat out sprint type of racing between pit stops, rather than the economy style that Formula 1 was used to with full tanks that started the races. All of these changes were brought in to make the racing more exciting, but did they make Formula 1 more dangerous? Ayrton Senna thought so. It's a stupidity to change rules, Formula 1 will regress, Senna said. He also thought the sophisticated electronic systems were a big aid to safety, as well as thinking refueling was unnecessary and dangerous. With the banning of electronic aids, Williams weren't the team they used to be. The Benetton Ford came out the gates fast. With their exciting young driver Michael Schumacher, his team had been quietly developing and improving in the shadows of the Williams dominance. The new rules reset had given Benetton the break they needed. After running the car for the first time, Schumacher said to his engineer, we can win races in this. In comparison, Senna was having a nightmare at Williams, telling his girlfriend, I feel it's going to be hard. Either I haven't adapted myself to the car yet, or the car just doesn't suit me. The car was twitchy and difficult to drive, but even though Benetton was better in comparison, the first incident of the season happened to a driver in that car. In pre-season testing, JJ Leto crashed and broke his neck. Luckily, he'd be able to make a full recovery, but he'd miss the first two races of the season, lending his seat to Joss Verstappen. But Verstappen would be involved in another incident at the first race, one that nearly claimed Martin Brundle's life, and led to a three-race ban for a driver. That driver is Eddie Irvine, who caused a multiple car pileup, launching Verstappen's car into the air, making contact with Brundle's head, breaking his helmet in two and briefly knocking him unconscious. With Brundle later saying, I woke up thinking, I've had an accident, how strange, but I didn't know how it happened and I was wondering what the other cars were doing there. The race was won by Schumacher, who survived a post-race protest by the Jordan team, questioning the legality of their aerodynamic splitters. Before the next race of the season, there was another testing crash, this time Jean Lacy and his Ferrari. He was knocked unconscious in the crash and he would also miss two races. Starting with the next race, the Pacific Grand Prix, which was won by Schumacher. But with Senna retiring on the first lap and watching trackside, he noticed an interesting sound coming from the Benetton. He confided with his team that he thought the Benetton was running traction control, a banned device. Something has to be done, Senna said. They're cheating. These cars should be checked. It was a rumour already in the paddock, along with a launch control device. These rumours later led the FIA to check the Benetton's black boxes from the next race of the season. Imola. Imola is a weekend that we wish never happened. One of the darkest weekends in Formula 1 history. It started with Rubens Barrichello's crash, where he swallowed his tongue and was lucky to survive, thanks for the quick reaction of the medical staff. But next, it seemed like Formula 1 had finally run out of luck. Roland Ratzenberger's front wing dislodged and got stuck underneath his front wheels, causing him to crash and lose his life. He was only in his third Formula 1 race. The incidents continued into the next day. JJ Leto, back in his first race since his neck injury, was involved in a start line pileup that sent a tyre into the crowd. Luckily, no one was seriously injured. The race was restarted after a few laps behind the safety car that had previously been sent through the start line crash debris. On lap 7, 
Senna sadly left the track and hit the wall. He had three very serious head injuries and was effectively dead there and then. Not many people knew the seriousness of Senna's condition, other than the medical staff and the FIA boss, Bernie Eccleston. As Damon Hill says in his biography, in Italy, if someone is declared dead at the scene of an incident, then the whole venue gets closed down and everything must stop, including an F1 race. It becomes technically a scene of a fatal road traffic accident. So nothing could be said officially at this stage for fear of invoking this rule. I wish I could say that the race wasn't started after this crash, but it was. Eccleston making sure that it would run the full distance, as it always did. That was the way of Formula 1. you think the rest of the race would run event free. Like, how many more incidents can one weekend have? As the local hospital had its third Formula 1 driver helicoptered in that weekend, around the same time a pit stop was going horribly wrong. A loose wheel going down the pits, hitting four mechanics, leaving them all in need of medical treatment. Thankfully, the Imola weekend came to an end and no one else could get hurt. But the question now was, why? Why is there so many incidents? Are the cars too fast? And what caused Senna to crash? There were allegations in the press about the steering column breaking, and with Italy treating it like a road traffic accident, manslaughter charges would later be instigated against key Williams staff. With the two deaths, it's unsurprising that the press would be all over the news like vultures, with some of the papers debating if Formula 1 should be banned. The FIA had to react. Regardless of the press, safety had to be improved. A practice crash by Carl Wendlinger highlighted that further. Crashing at Monaco with its close barriers, Wendlinger was left in a coma after the incident. The FIA response was a raft of changes pushed through for the current season, as well as that the drivers also confirming the setup of the Grand Prix Drivers Association. But before Formula 1 reached the next race, there was yet another testing crash. This time, Pedro Lamy vaulted a spectator fence at Silverstone, breaking both his legs. Crazy. At the Spanish Grand Prix, the Drivers Association decided that a corner wasn't safe for the current Formula 1 cars, so a temporary chicane made out of tyres was set up to slow them down. But that didn't stop the next incident happen to Andrea Montemini, who had been brought in to replace the late Ratzenberger. Everyone was relieved when it was only a broken ankle for Montemini. But how many more drivers are going to get injured in this crazy season? It's relentless. With all these crashes taking the headlines, the heat on Benetton having an illegal car had gone quiet, but things were about to change. After the mega start of the French Grand Prix, everyone was interested in Schumacher's getaway. It looked too good, like it had the use of launch control, an illegal device. The FIA finally taken a closer look at the Benetton, confirming that they had an option 13 on their car. Launch control was found, but it couldn't be proved that it had been used, so no penalty was given. At the British Grand Prix, Schumacher overtook Hill on the parade lap, a strict no-no back then. Schumacher then ignored a five second penalty he had to serve. So as punishment, Schumacher was disqualified from the race and given a two race ban. At the next race, there was a pit lane fire for Schumacher's teammate, Verstappen, with Verstappen and four mechanics having minor burns from the incident. The FIA investigated the Benetton's fuel system for not having a filter, which meant fuel flowed into the car 12% faster than normal. No punishment was given, but the team was found guilty of tampering. Schumacher then won the Belgian Grand Prix, but was later disqualified again, this time for a barge board being worn too low. At the penultimate race of the season, driver safety was back on the agenda, with another near-death experience for Martin Brundle. Before the Japanese Grand Prix, Brundle had raised the fact that using tractors during a race was a big safety issue. He was ignored, and to keep with the weirdness of the season, Brundle nearly hit a tractor himself. It was an extremely wet race, where a lot of people were going off. Brundle aquaplaned, heading towards a tractor, Brundle thought he was going to die. Luckily for Brundle, he misses it. Unfortunately, he collected a marshal in the process and broke his leg. Brundle got a reprimand for this incident. Okay, so now we head into the last race of the season. A season that's had 46 drivers take part and 41 driver changes. A season full of incidents, controversy and penalties. Surely we're going to have a normal end of the year. Nothing else is going to be crazy or nothing else is going to go wrong. Surely. Schumacher and Hill, with only one point between them, are having a thrilling, edge of your seat, close battle. Schumacher loses it under pressure and 
contact. He takes Hill out and in doing so wins the title under a shadow of more controversy. But did Schumacher do it on purpose? We may never find out. Schumacher later on admitted his 1997 crash into Villeneuve and his Monaco parking incident, but he didn't admit this crash with Hill. Maybe that's because it was a genuine accident, or maybe, unlike the other two, where he had received penalties, he managed to get away with this one. If you're interested to know how Damon Hill bravely dealt with the heartbreaking tragedy of Senna's death, this gripping mini documentary will answer that for you.